Well, thanks, Liz, and thank you for everybody who's, who's uh, showed up already. I, I'm assuming we might pick up a few more. I know some few people are saying they might show up a little bit later, but thank you all for attending this, uh, this broadcast from the Sh Chicago Bruseum. I'm very, very fortunate and, um, and honored to be a part of the National Board of directors for the Chicago Museum and uh, Liz hit me up not that long ago about with the obviously with the very odd and strange circumstances we're living under if I could do some instruction on kind of what I do and and beer history in general and so that is uh, my goal today hopefully you're all here to hear about uh, brewing beer in ancient Greece which is really what started off my entire project uh, about uh, four or five years ago, but to be honest, it started probably about eight to 10 years ago. So that's kind of what I'm gonna be doing today. Now, that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and kick over here um, so you guys can see my screen, so you can see um, some of the images I'm talking about as we move through uh, today's uh, presentation. And uh, don't hesitate at uh, any point if you want to uh, kind of interject or uh, ask some questions. I'm going to try to monitor the questions as they come in. If for some reason I miss them, um, Lucas is also on board and he's going to try to let me know when they uh, kind of start to trickle in. So um, yes, um, hopefully you're all here to hear about brewing beer in the world of wine, drinking in the ancient Aegean. And as I said before, uh, this is really a project that got me involved with the Chicago Museum, kind of uh, multiple, uh, you know, kind of uh, degrees of separation, but now we're all together, which is great. And I, I love seeing this initiative moving forward in regards to beer history and beer development, because certainly it is, it seems to be an untapped period or era or topic, whatever you want to look at in regards to history, um, the, the deeper you dig, uh, one thing that I've always loved about uh, the topic for the last decade of my research is that no matter where you go, no matter what people you research, no matter who you encounter or have exchanges with, alcohol uh, seems to be something that ties us all together. And uh, that is regardless of whether or not you drink or you don't drink. I mean, the people who choose not to consume alcohol are validating that, that perspective or that aspect that alcohol affects all of our lives. They physically have to choose not to consume it. And those of us who do consume it, consume it regularly, whether it be beer, you know, spirits, wine, whatever it might be, it also becomes a part of our culture. And uh, to give a little bit of background to this presentation where I'm gonna go here in the next 45 minutes to an hour, I'll, I'll open it up for full questioning um, about 45 minutes from now and do a little bit of Q&A is that um, how this whole, uh, this whole thing started, and you can see on my introductory slide here is that um, I have two full-time jobs. So I am the innovation and wood cellar manager at Avery Brewing Company. I've been working there for uh, about eight years. Uh, started from the ground up. I was a bartender when I first started, and now I kind of run all that program. So I oversee all of our new brand development and all of our barrel age uh, projects or program. Uh, at the same time, though, I'm also a professor at the University of Colorado in Boulder, and at CU Boulder, I teach classics, anthropology, and art history, and this is something I've been doing for even longer. I uh, started uh, there as a graduate assistant in 2008, but I became an adjunct professor in 2010, so now I've been doing it uh, there for about a decade, and eventually my two worlds started to come together, and I started to realize there were pretty major gaps uh, in, uh, in, in the world of ancient beer production. And so this whole project, this whole program really kicked off with that. I wanted to explore and learn a little bit more about ancient beer production. Certainly there are a few scholars or individuals out there who have dabbled in the topic, but I really wanted to dive in wholeheartedly. And I think uh, by the end of today, you'll see what I mean by that. I, I, I've committed my life basically to researching uh, beer production and beer history worldwide, but my major focus is certainly the ancient world and looking at Greco-Roman, Egyptian, Near Eastern, biblical traditions for alcohol production and how it's affected the modern world. So title, Brewing Beer in the World of Wine, Drinking the Ancient Aegean, we're going to talk specifically about Bronze Age Greece and its beer production, which was clearly a part of the world that we would consider a place that produced wine, not necessarily a place that produced beer. 
that being said, though, too, like I said, my, my various titles that I hold are Innovation Wood Cellar Manager. Beer Archaeologist is also what they call me at Avery, and that's uh, mainly due to my, my creation of a new series at Avery. In 2016, I started a series called The Ales of Antiquity. Now, this topic, which is uh, very, uh, very conducive to uh, that topic of the beginning of the Ales of Antiquity is uh, how this whole program started for me in 2016 is I was appointed to, at that time, what was called the Special Projects Division of Aver Brewing Company, and that meant we could brew whatever we wanted to brew. Uh, I thought it'd be interesting to start recreating historic beers, um, and not just recreating recipes, trying to recreate the process, um, virtually everything down to the most integral levels, how do we rebuild or recreate these beers. Uh, the first beer I created was a Bronze Age Greek beer. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that uh, this afternoon. As a result of that, they gave me the title of Beer Archaeologist. Um, conducively, at the same time, I gained all these titles at the university. So I teach classics, art history, anthropology, and also mechanical engineering. Now I'm uh, starting up a program on brewing, uh, literally the, the process and the, the mechanical engineering aspect of brewing. Uh, those classes will start in 2021. Uh, but uh, like I said, this is what I spend most of my time doing is taking care of, of our barrel program. It grows uh, in, in, in recedes and you know fluctuates in regards to its volume over the course of, a, of any given year. But um, at our peak, we've been taking care of upwards of 4,600 oak barrels. Uh, and uh, that's what we do. So me and my program, we spend a lot of our time working with these products, which is a lot of fun. Uh, and at the same time, it blends very much into the Ales of Antiquity program. So uh, with the Ales of Antiquity, just to give it a quick rundown before I talk about Greek brewing specifically, what we are going to be talking about most specifically today is this beer. The very first beer that I kicked off in 2016, actually launched in September of 2016, was Nestor's Cup, a beer from 1350 BCE. So a beer that's, you know, 3,300 plus years old. I'm going to talk a little bit about how we got to that point in, uh, that, uh, in that production cycle. But after I launched it, I'll be completely honest, when I launched the Ales of Antiquity series, I had no idea nor did I intend for it to become something that was as popular as it has become, um, something that's been sought after um, pretty readily in, in the United States as well as in some uh, international locations. And it was almost immediate that I was contacted to start doing other projects. And so since then, uh, kicked it off and it kicked that program off in September of 2016. Since then, uh, done a whole slew of Ales of Antiquity, a Kansu Imheb and Ancient Egyptian Beer, Ragnar's Drapa, a historic Viking beer, Pachamama, a historic uh, a Peruvian chicha. Uh, we also did two beers um, from the ancient monastic tradition. I had the wonderful and phenomenal experience of uh, going to Umbria, Central Italy in 2017 and spending a, an extensive amount of time with the monks of Nursia, uh, where St. Benedict was born, learning the ancient trade, the historic trade of brewing and the monastic tradition, came back and brewed two beers with actually their historic yeast strain. Uh, also did an ancient uh, Israeli beer. Uh, it was, I was commissioned or, or propositioned by the Denver Museum of Nature and Science to work on a beer from the Dead Sea Scrolls. And there are references to alcohol production in the Dead Sea Scrolls, as well as the biblical tradition. We created Beersheba out of that. And then most recently in the last year uh, to year and a half, I did kind of a micro study. I, I was asked to start doing beers that were newer, which was uh, interesting for me um, in regards to, I've lived so much in the ancient world. The question was, can I, recreate some beers that are only a couple hundred years old. And that was kind of the goal over the last year, did a case study on beers that any, any one of us could have, if we lived during that era of the late 18th century, early 19th century, we could have experienced all three of these beers. So created a beer uh, for George Washington, a beer that we actually know he was purchasing from a couple of different venues. Uh, 1752 India Pale Ale is an homage to the original IPA and we didn't just recreate the recipe, we rec recreated the process, literally tried to mimic its shipment from England to India. Uh, and then also most recently, our most recent ale of antiquity, number 10 in the series is Monticello, a tip of the hat to the individuals that brewed beer at the Monticello estate, um, most notably, uh, looking at the Hemings family 
and giving uh, due diligence to the brewers, the enslaved brewers that existed um, on uh, that physical estate. And so uh, that was our last ale of antiquity. But bringing us full circle to where we are now, let's talk a little bit about why you're all here today. Let's talk about uh, the, the brewing of beer and the world of wine and the, and the Greek Aegean and prior to it being a Greek unified location. Now, what I show you here on the map is, uh, is obviously just a satellite image of the ancient Mediterranean world. Uh, and all of this, as you will see here in a little bit, uh, basically pre presents evidence for beer production, uh, depending on what region of the ancient world you came from. But when it comes down to the real hard evidence of trying to formulate and figure out where beer originated, uh, we have some evidence. I would say it's not as old as I might like it to be, but still we know that beer has been around at least for 7,000 years, dating back to 5,000 BCE with Sumerian residue tests indicate that beer production was at play. We have tablets indicating the process from that time. Egyptian grave goods um, from the date frame you see here, BCE, that indicates that we were, uh, or they were producing beer that would actually be placed in the tombs. The very well-known Sumerian hymn to Ninkasi, also discussing beer production in 1900 BCE. And then of course, the famous Epic of Gilgamesh from 18th century BCE that also talks about beer. And it talks about beer in regards to being uh, a thing that uh, literally makes us human as we'll be visiting in just a moment. They also, the ancient peoples prior to the Greeks, they give us actual firm artistic and archeological evidence to support this very famous and by, for most of you probably well-known a uh, piece of symbology from uh, a stela from El Amarna, so from the Amarna period uh, of, of, uh, of Egyptian dominion, we actually see royalty consuming uh, or at least high ranking politicians in some regards drinking beer from a, a straw, a reeded straw that had a filtration system on it that would allow them to pull the sludge out, leave the sludge behind, but drink the beer and consume it. And the Egyptians were well known uh, as peoples that celebrated beer, where a lot of other cultures, like I said, the whole title of this presentation is, you know, beer brewing in the, in the world of wine. When you get to the Greco-Roman tradition, they often poo-poo the idea of beer, they, de they demean it, they see it as an inferior beverage. The Egyptians never did that. The Egyptians actually saw it as a very preeminent uh, drink. It was something that was affiliated with everyone, royalty in particular as well. And just to give a couple of other, of other archaeological or artistic examples of this, we see it in beer receipts um, from ancient Iraq, or even, again, the hymn to Ninkasi, a beer recipe or a beer process, as it was laid out, presumably conceived as early as 4000 BCE, but comes into full fruition a little bit later. At Girsu, also in modern Iraq, we hear of rationing of beer um, for various individuals, ancient Sumerian Texts indicate that beer was readily consumed and there are monthly barley rations that could be either used for the consumption of foods or for beer. And as many of us know, barley is, easy, is more easily consumed as a beverage than it is a food product because of its roughage. It's obviously a very coarse grain. There's no gluten involved in it for a food source. And so a lot of them turned it into a beverage and we hear that when it was turned into a beverage that adults would consume upwards of 30 to 40 pints of these uh, barley based drinks a month, children upwards of 20 pints, uh, and what you see on the right hand side is cuneiform uh, tablet also indicating these things is on display in the British Museum. So the question might be before we dive into the Greek precedent for brewing, where does beer come from then? I mean, how old is it? And I'll tell you, I'm, I'm currently writing a book on the topic and, and I think that even my estimates in the early portions of my book may not be old enough. I would say based on uh, the evidence, mostly archeological evidence, obviously nothing textual, might put it as early as 9,000 to 8,500 BCE that we see the formation of beer. But a lot of that discussion, that argument is very, very much contingent upon uh, what, what you see on this map. And it has to do with why beer grew where it did. Uh, why did it become a major convention of these cultures? And what we're looking at on the map is in fact, Syria. This is ancient Syria. 
Now what we're seeing on the map is actually a demonstration of vegetation that once existed in Syria, approximately 10,000 to 9,000 BCE. You'll notice from the key at below that it's heavily forested. You might be like, well, Syria, I mean, that's a very desert-esque climate. How do they have a heavy forest, right? Well, we, we clearly know that there are major climatic shifts that have occurred over the last 12,000 years. And as a result of that, what happened between 10,000 and 8,000 BC was this. So all of that forestation is essentially cleared out. And what starts to populate in place of all of the large forestation areas in Syria were wild grasses most notably wild barley and wheat strains, most notably wheat out of the two. Wheat and barley start to propagate, but both of them um, start to come in in this wild fashion. The question then becomes, well, did people harvest this wild grain for food or drink production? And certainly the field is very much still split on this, but I will say, though all very rudimentary, in its uh, orientation here, you'll notice that if you look at the orient, uh, the way this is laid out, starting at the bottom, the oldest dates, 11,500 BCA, working our way forward, everything is all hunter-gatherer until we hit about this 8,500-ish mark BCE. This is really interesting because when we think about it from a more classical approach to anthropology, the presumption has always been that the domestication of crops and grains may be started around 5000 BCE. That date keeps getting pushed back. And I'm one of those individuals who fully supports that, that we too often presume that the ancients were dumb, they didn't know any better, they didn't know what they were handling, they didn't know what they were doing, and because they weren't growing crops of, of barley or wheat, they didn't know how to process it. And I think that's a little bit too obtuse in regards to our, our uh, our view, our perspective in the ancient peoples that they probably knew what they were doing. And I think that it's likely that they started producing beer before they did bread um, out, of, um, out of some of these originated uh, grains. Now, in regards to Gilgamesh, uh, as I brought up before, Gilgamesh is actually our most recent text really out of the ancient Near East that lends itself, leads into this discussion of ancient uh, Greek brewing. And what I love about the story of Gilgamesh is just to put it in context really quickly and to quote it, it says, Enkidu, a shaggy, unkempt, almost bestial, primitive man who ate grass and could milk wild animals, wanted to test his strength against Gilgamesh, the demigod-like sovereign. Taking no chances, Gilgamesh sent a prostitute to Enkidu to learn of his strength and weaknesses. Enkidu enjoyed a week with her during which she taught him of civilization. Enkidu knew not what bread was, nor how one ate it. He also had not learned to drink beer. The prostitute opened her mouth and spoke to Enkidu, eat the bread now, O Enkidu, as it belongs to life. Drink also beer, as it is the custom of the land. Enkidu drank seven cups of beer, and his heart soared. In this condition, he washed himself and became a human being. And even in these early formations, of Near Eastern textualization for beer production, to be human is to be a beer drinker. As soon as Gilgamesh drinks the beer, he washes himself and becomes a human being. And this is very much conducive to the biblical tradition, which is not often discussed. Benefits of barley are mentioned upwards of 25 times in the Tanakh or the, uh, the, the Jewish uh, Bible or the Old Testament of the Christian tradition. It's even referenced in the Code of Hammurabi, very well-known uh, artistic, uh, or artistic piece um, with this law code that's written on it, upwards of 181 to 182 laws that are dictated on the Code of Hammurabi um, for the Babylonian Empire, 1772. And these law codes also include laws for barkeeps, people who owned uh, actual bar establishments, how they're supposed to divvy out alcohol how they're supposed to request or require that people pay for it, so on and so forth. And so beer has been at the core of it for a long time. This is true also of the ancient Egyptian tradition, and this is very much in brief as we lend ourselves again into the Greek tradition, but in they are right on the cusp of the ancient Aegean. And I, I would argue and have argued that we don't really, I, I don't think we see a beer industry until we hit ancient Egypt. The Egyptians were industrializing beer production to the extent that just as a case study, Tel El Farca, which was excavated and uncovered approximately, uh, I guess at this point, what are we in, 2020? So it was about 
four or five years ago, Telo Farca, which is up in the Delta, you can see it here on the left-hand side of your screen, very close to Tannis, um, obviously made famous by Indiana Jones uh, and the Raiders of the Lost Ark, uh, an old uh, capital location for Egypt, but Telo Farca nearby, uh, started pre-dynastic, meaning before even pharaohs ruled Egypt, but there in the last few years, they've excavated these. Now that might look like just a big old mess on the screen, but as you start peeling back the layers of this archeological um, discovery, what actually reveals itself are the remnants of breweries. And breweries do exist all throughout ancient Egypt, whether they be in the Delta, central Egypt near Abydos, further down south near Thebes, so on and so forth. We see this multi-stage brewing process uh, and we can see this 3D reconstruction here on the dates it to the pre-dynastic era where they had essentially the same process we have today. They had a mash, they had a pool, and they had a packaging hall, if you wanted to call it that, a place where it would be placed in terracotta pots and then distributed outwards. Now, why I give you all this Near Eastern uh, Egyptian background before we dive into the Greek context is that when it really comes to the question of Greek brewing, uh, the ancients, there are the ancient peoples, tell us that the Greeks are involved in this transition or this transference of the brewing process culturally. They say, and this is coming from primarily Greco-Roman primary sources, they tell us that the Sumerians taught the Egyptians, the Egyptians taught the Greeks. The Greeks then taught the Romans, and then the Romans taught the, quote, savage tribes of Britain, which is kind of interesting because uh, most, uh, my, myself most notably, but a lot of other individuals disagree with that idea that they were taught by the Romans. Uh, Pliny and Tacitus as well, they attribute the development of the, quote, brewing art to the Celtic and Teutonic peoples of Britain and Central Europe. And so we kind of have a framework at play here. But like I said, this is coming from an ancient context and ancient tradition. This is what the ancient people saw. They saw, you'll notice between numbers two and three, that the Greeks were a part of this process. Why that is really quite fascinating is that nobody ever really writes about that. If you were to map this overall project or this process as the ancients lay it out, it's very linear, right? It's, it's as though it, it comes out of ancient Samaria, it hits places like Cyprus, Egypt, makes its way to Crete, starts to work its way into Greece. Then it starts to move its way up into the Indo-European north um, in Turkey and uh, where Thrace or Macedonia would be, and then up into Central Europe and to Northern Africa. And this is kind of the way that history has been written about the production or the process or the transference of the brewing art. Very, very linear came out of ancient Syria and moved its way uh, westward. Now, as, as I've been looking at this for several years, and, and I would say that I'm probably not the only one that questions this very linear approach to it, there are big problems at play with this, and some of them are at the end of the line. Uh, Iberia, for example, becomes a melting pot of culinary cultures because it's so heavily influenced by so many different people throughout um, ancient historic history. The other one is Crete. Crete sitting right at the center of the Eastern Mediterranean becomes kind of opinion for the transference of ideas, goods, so on and so forth. So I don't like this model. I, I think Crete and Iberia are critical components of this and deserve a tremendous amount of study, but really there are no lines. It should look like this. It should look more like a bunch of bubbles all over the European map. All of these places were producing beer, but none of them were always influenced by an outside culture. They were developing their own beer styles as we move forward. And that was the case with Greece. When it comes to Greek beer production, the vast majority of textual material would say that the Greeks simply did not produce beer. Um, and that's still being produced in some modern scholarship that the, that the Greeks just did not produce beer plain and simple. Now I will say what I'm talking about here with Bronze Age brewing, talking about ancient Aegean brewing, the Greeks didn't see themselves as a unified people yet. So we're talking about cultures like the Minoans, the Mycenaeans, the Trojans, they were all separate. 
but they still become a contingent, a part, uh, a, a predecessor, an influence on Greek brewing later on. And they were impacted by the movement of domestication as wheat, barley, lentils make their way westward, make their way out of Syria, into the Greek Aegean, into Greece itself, they become a mainstay. And also one place that is hypercritical in all this, like I said before, is Crete. Because Crete, the island of Crete became kind of a redistribution center for all things, not only just agriculture, but ideas, technologies. It had contact with everything, whether it be Troy, Rome, Carthage, Sicily, Egypt, you name it, you can see it on the map here. And as a result of that, they build up the island of Crete to be a redistribution center for these, these ideologies and these goods, the most famous of them being Canossos, right? Center, which we're going to look at a little bit greater detail here in a moment. But for their redistribution network, they established a whole slew of cities, Kania, Phaistos, Malia, Zakro. It was, an, it was a way to, to kind of put this blanket approach out for the redistribution of their items and their goods. Now, if we zoom in on Canossos right at the center there, all palace structures, we call them palace structures, though there's no indication there was any royalty ruling them. Uh, but all of them had these large West magazines. And within these West magazines were a whole slew of items that might be stored. Um, here showing what they look like when the large pithoi, as they're called, they're these huge vases or vessels. And I mean, I do mean large. You can see them here on the right hand side as they've been pulled out of their cyst pits, but this is actually what they look like. I mean, uh, many of them are even larger than this. Some would be upwards of seven feet tall. And they would store dry goods in them. Uh, and they would line these cysts with gypsum and lead to prevent leaching of moisture into the containers. They were lidded so they could be walked over. And it was more than just grain and oil storage. Uh, There's indications that they were storing liquid goods as well. Um, most indications say it's wine. Very easily could have been beer as well. And the reason why I would say it very easily could have been beer is not only because, you know, we have this presumption that ideas, technologies are moving out of the out of the east westward out of Syria to Crete and beyond but also when we think about um, how this develops over time if they're going to be moving outwards from Syria we're going to see colonization on the Minoan front and actually one place just directly north of Crete so Crete is down kind of off the map below here if you follow my cursor there's this little bubble at the bottom it's the upper portion of Crete, we get to the island of Thera, uh, the closest uh, island in the what we call the Cycladic or Cycladic islands of the Aegean. There are the remains of what I often will call for my students uh, in classics, the kind of the, the Bronze Age Pompeii. Um, it was a location that was destroyed by a very violent volcanic eruption somewhere between 1450 and 1350 BCE. The island of Thera itself is a volcano. And on that island uh, was a city called Akrotiri. And Akrotiri um, was badly decimated by this archeological eruption. Um, portions of the city broke off in a landslide during the eruption and now exist about two miles off the coast out in the open water. Uh, but what's left behind uh, looks basically like this. And there's about a five block radius that's been excavated. It's been being excavated since late 1960s. Uh, by a man named Spiridon Marinatus. Now, what uh, and Spiridon, Spiridon Marinatus unfortunately passed away several decades ago um, in an incident at the location uh, with the roof that collapsed in and killed him and several other archaeologists. Uh, but it's been rebuilt. And what I found interesting and why I said this is kind of a conversation, a discussion, a lecture on how the Ellesby Antiquity series started was um, one of the things that always kind of rubbed me the wrong way when it came to discussions of historic beer was everybody said the Greeks didn't brew beer, plain and simple, just doesn't exist. And I found that to be just kind of a ridiculous statement because every other culture in some way, shape, or form brews alcohol, and usually it's rooted around beer production. Now, we know the Greeks were producing wine, obviously, uh, in, in droves, and it becomes their mainstay. And I'm not saying that they preferred beer over wine by any means. But beer was there, they just weren't writing about it very often. And with that criteria, what also made me very curious, when I was there um, several years ago, back in 2015, my wife and I spent quite a bit of time in Turkey and Greece um, doing research for this project. I hadn't even launched the series yet. But what 
was really strange was a lot of the items that were uh, were being excavated from the site, especially at Akrotiri. And again, this is a Minoan site dating to 1450 to 1350 when it was uh, encapsulated. And I was really curious as to why they had so many vases that had these vegetal motifs on them. Notice that it looks kind of grass-like. They show up all over the place. These are excavation photos from the 1980s. Notice there's one right there in the foreground on the map. Also, uh, when we look at the modern ruin as it exists today, there's one right there um, in a storage house for a private estate. So why all of this focus on grasses? Things that look very roughly like a wheat, a barley, or just a grass in general. And why it was very curious to me is because the island of Thera is not conducive to the growth of these things, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, to bring that to full fruition as well, um, after poking around in a bookstore on Thera, the, like the one bookstore, because it's a tiny island, I made an offer to the, the bookseller there to buy all of the excavation reports from Spirit, Spirit on Meridatus, and I thought he was going to cry because who knows how long those books have been sitting on that shelf um, that he was trying to offload for probably decades. And me as a classicist, I'm the only one that's going to come in probably and ask for them, so I bought them. And my wife and I were flying around from Turkey to Greece, island to island, and um, one night, late at night, I'm reading one of the excavation reports, and this is what the account said. I'm going to skip about halfway down just in the interest of time of the quote. What I thought was interesting was he was talking about, Spiridon was talking about the analysis of stuff he was finding in pots. And he said uh, that under the influence of heat, dryness, or both, it had lost part of its original mass. Examination under a strong lens showed that the substance was in fact barley flour, which had been very imperfectly ground. The farina had disappeared, but the bark part of the barley grains could still be seen in the form of thin needles or small straws. Some grains of barley that had slipped through the millstone were found intact. It was evidently not perfect flour, but coarse and something like the Homeric olukatai employed in the sacrifices. And all of us that are probably privy to this conversation know that what he's talking about the fact that the husk is still present um, was a firm indicator to me that this is what he's saying. It's spent grain. And this is not just haphazard, because right next to it were vases found with perfectly ground flour, where the husk had been removed. You don't leave this stuff behind in a vase unless it's intentional when you have the ability to fully produce flour. This immediately, for me, triggered the idea, the fact, the evidence that beer production is taking a step further that, what I also found very interesting from the excavation reports and the items revealed from these excavations were pots like this, the nippled ewer jar with a barley motif on it. This, according to Marinatus, also was for apparently pouring libations on the tables of offerings to assure a good crop of barley. Why would you pour wine if you're wanting a good crop of barley? That's what I want to know. And why are you putting all of this vegetal motif on vases of barley? when you're pouring a product that's made of something different. To make that even more prevalent, when we were there in 2015, for the very first time, they started to put on other ewer jars, and it's a common motif on the island of Thera, is the barley motif. We're seeing actual vegetation depicted on serving vessels for alcohol that depicts barley. Now, why, again, why put barley on there if you're just going to pour wine out of it? And the other thing that I think is really, really interesting about this, we have the archaeological evidence to support that we have barley left behind from the brewing process. We have spent grain. We have vessels that say they were pouring something made of barley. But also, this is what grows on the island of Thera. There is no barley or wheat that goes on the island of Thera. It's, it's highly arid. It is a volcanic island and it's perfect for grape production. These are all vines. As a matter of fact, it's really cool. The grape vines grow like this naturally. They curl in on themselves. Um, the island of Thera, or we know it better as Santorini, is a well-known location for the production of white wine in the modern era. And uh, this was a location that is simply not conducive to cereals. And so I think it likely um, uh, this is my own theory or hypothesis, but they may have actually valued alcohol-produced 
via cereals over wine a little bit more because it was rare on the island of Akrotiri. Again, this is just my conjecture and no firm evidence to support that aspect yet, but clearly they're making beer or celebrating beer on this island. Now, if we move to Mycenae, which was also another well-known Bronze Age location, and consider it, this is where I chose to focus my reproduction of a beer from the ancient Bronze Age. And uh, the reason I did that was because uh, there's a, even more extensive, more advanced, uh, newer processes looking at the archaeobotanical evidence is left behind. Now, the Mycenaeans, like I said, the Minoans primarily thrived in the Aegean, Crete, some of these islands that they colonized, but the Mycenaeans, they thrived on the Peloponnese and the Greek mainland. And you would think if we turn to them, we should probably be able to find even deeper evidence for the production of beer because they're a little bit newer. Uh, they they post-date the Minoans by a couple hundred years. Also, their story is well known and well told. I, told. I almost I, I assure that almost everybody who's chiming in right now knows a little bit about the Mycenaeans, but never maybe knew that they were called the Mycenaeans. Sorry, just need a little drink of beer to wet my whistle here. But the reason why I would say that you know a little bit about them is because their story seems to be recounted or at least preserved to some degree in the Homeric tradition. The Iliad and the Odyssey of Homer, though it's not written down until the 8th century, maybe 7th century, but most of us think the 8th century BCE, though it's not written down until then, many of the accounts, the stories that are told seem to date to the Bronze Age, date to the late Bronze Age, probably somewhere between we'll say 1150 and 1000, or maybe 1200 and 1000 BCE. Now these stories, though they layer a lot of different contextualizations, they are, uh, it was an oral tradition for years, for generations, for centuries. Um, it's kind of like the telephone game. It's, the story was retold so many times that different layers from different eras start to work their way in. But there are pieces of that story that seem to date all the way back to the Bronze Age. So should we find references to beer in that tradition? Well, you would think so, based on what I've said. But some scholars have said otherwise. Auberger and Guppel have said, back in 2010, when they put out their publication, that, quote, Homer does not mention beer because his focus was on glorifying a heroic past. This echoes ancient interpretations which postulated that there was no reference to Homeric heroes eating vegetables, fish, or fowl, because any food other than roasted red meat was somehow considered inappropriate to their dignity. Now, I think that's an interesting quote because it just, it's a presumption. It's not actually diving into the details of the time frame. Because if you look back at what archaeologically we see revealed from the period that Homer's writing about, this is from, from Nestor, the palace of Nestor at the, the Mycenaean location of Pylos. Now, as you can see from the color coding, you look into it, this was kind of a central location of the palace where people would come meet with the king or high ranking politicians. But some of these other shaded areas around are indicative of things that were stored nearby. Now, the big one, 104 up here, is indicated as a location for the storage of wine. And we do know they consumed a lot of wine. But did everybody consume wine? I don't know, it's hard to say. One thing that is very clear is they like to drink. The people of Pelos drank a lot of alcohol, so much so that pottery analysis of the palace shows this. You can see the high concentrations of pot sherds and pottery that were found in the excavations, whether they be, or ne be near the palace, on the fringes of the, of, of the city itself, at the city dumps, basically 7,106 stem drinking cups were found just in the vicinity of this one locale. In addition to that, we look at it from a different angle. We're seeing the palace up here, but what about the coastal area? We're along the coastline, same thing. I mean, we see a whole bunch of deposits of ceramics that may have been for wine, may have been for beer. I don't know exactly if it was just wine or beer, but not everybody can drink wine. Wine's a more laborious, longer process to produce. Cereals and beer production are quick, as we know. Produce a beer, in the ancient world, you could produce a beer in upwards of 48, 72 hours um, on the short end. Wine obviously is going to take a little bit longer and the process is a little bit more rigorous. On top of that as well, in regards to references to Greek drinking, there are terms in Greek 
that discuss beer, uh, beer or alcohol production, most notably the terms brutos or bruton. Now this is just a word, Greek word meaning a brewed beverage. Many texts have said that it's not Greek in its orientation, that it was a Thracian word, uh, and therefore the Greeks had no idea what it meant. I don't think that's necessarily the case either. It's, 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 very obtuse, uh, it's a very simplified statement. I should say not obtuse, but a very simplified statement approach to the terms brutos and bruton. Um, they have other terminology like tas krithos es tu pomo kataleus, and they grind barley for a drink. And that is in reference to the Thracians yet again. And that's why most people thought the brutos or bruton was in reference to the Thracian peoples. But when the Greeks talk about brewed beverages and they reuse the words like brutos or bruton, they usually are talking about the peoples of Thrace. You can see them on the map up here again, north, northeast of Macedonia or Egypt to the south. So does that mean that just simply plain and simple, you know, brewed beverages, beer in particular, is 100% a product of these outside forces. Maybe, maybe it does mean that as we move forward in Greek history, things just become much more focused on the grape and less focused on the grain, with a few exceptions. What I think is really interesting about the Greek religion itself is deeply rooted at the core of their being and their history, like the Homeric hymn to Demeter. Uh, in this passage, essentially, uh, that is uh, a reference to Demeter asking for basically a libation or an offering to be presented to her, and her attendant, Metanira, you can see her name here in the first line, Metanira comes in, tries to offer wine to the goddess Demeter, and she says, no, no, take it away and bring me the barley drink. That's literally what she says, bring me the drink that's mixed with barley. And so even Demeter, who's the goddess, you know, one of these goddesses of agriculture and uh, fruitfulness within kind of the, uh, the Greek pantheon of, of, ag of, of agrarian uh, possibilities, agriculture, food source, she declines the grape in favor of a barley-based drink. In fact, her name, Demeter, if you were to very, very, very uh, directly translate it, she is essentially the barley mother. So it brings us back to Homer yet again. Does Homer actually give us some indication that beer was being consumed in the ancient world? Well, the Homeric tradition was written down for the first time in the eighth century. Homer, whoever he, she, they were, we don't know exactly who Homer was or they were. One thing that is, uh, th th these texts have been uh, written about so often, one thing that's agreed upon is they've been considered the most important texts from the ancient Greco-Roman world. Um, thousands of papers are written on them every decade. They've been written about them for centuries. Uh, but finally, Homer writes it down in the 8th century BCE. When he does, he references something called kukeon. Now, this term if you're familiar with Patrick McGovern, Patrick, uh, Dr. McGovern and I, we've, we've bantered, we've gone back and forth on this topic before. Um, Dr. McGovern has, has definitely paved the way for some of these studies in the ancient Greco, uh, Greco tradition, especially Greek tradition, trying to explore um, kind of what was going on in these various facets. And one thing that I find very interesting, uh, we don't necessarily agree completely on what Kuke Ona is, but we are trying to get to the core of it, trying to figure out what it was because it's referenced in a lot of different locations. I give you the passages in the Iliad and the Odyssey below both books. And Dr. McGovern says that uh, in his book, Uncorking the Past, that uh, Kukeon was probably the mixing of wine, barley, beer, and meat. And the final product is this blended beverage, Kukeon. Now, McGovern has stated that the Greeks, also on page 208 uh, of that text, he says that they did not drink barley, beer, pure and simple, but mixed it with other fermented beverages. Um, I don't really necessarily agree with that for a couple of, of reasons, though. I mean, certainly he has the chem he has the archaeochemical analysis to back what he found in the in some of the vessels. Uh, but I think it also operates under the presumption that vessels are just discarded after they're used to drink one beverage. So wine, beer, and mead separately fermented, mixed together, and drunk, and then the, the item is tossed. I don't know if I necessarily believe that. Um, it wouldn't be necessarily a it's not really attested anywhere else in the antiquity. Um, also, the archaeochemical evidence that was presented by Zekas and Martlu, who also uh, McGovern was published in, in that same collective work, 
they indicate that it's not a mixed beverage at all, but the successive use of the vessel for wine, beer, and mead using this biomolecular investigation. And it helped validate a whole series of things. These same, this kukeon drink, or kikeon, however you want to pronounce it, um, was found all over. It's found in Kanya, in the Cycladic Islands, found in large mugs in Mycenae, Arminoe, feeding bottles for children from Medea. So was the Homeric kukeon produced in a cup or was it something that was fermented altogether? Could they have possibly fermented, brewed a beverage that included grapes, honey, and barley all in one, and then it was drank for some kind of religious festival? I think that is the more like, likely culprit. Also, what is cool in regards to kukeon cups or kikeon cups as they have been identified dating all the way back 1700 BCE in the Bronze Age, Zamenthos, a Minoan Crete location, I love these cups. These are kukeon cups as they were identified. They were used for the drinking of that mixed beverage. Notice the vegetal motif. Doesn't it remind you of what I just looked at before? And I think it's really interesting that grassy feature comes in, the barley feature comes in. Now, when it comes to reproducing, recreating an ancient beer, the very first beer I, I created in the ancient uh, series in the, in the Ales of Antiquity series was in fact a very called Nestor's Cup. Took uh, archaeobotanical, archaeochemical analysis from Papa Thanasio in 2015, and I put all these items in order. These are, in, uh, these are the items that had the highest density in the finds of the archaeochemical and archaeobotanical analysis and evidence. And I chose what I could find, einkorn, six row barley, elderberry figs, acorns, so on and so forth. Um, and this is how we recreated the first uh, historic gale. I tried to make it as close as I could as possible to the original recipe, but I will tell you 2016 when I kicked off the series, I wasn't as doing, I wasn't as uh, rigorously following the process like I do today. So the series become very nerdy. Um, I, I won't really create beers anymore unless I can follow every aspect of the process. But still, what's cool in regards to it, what I will do real quick is stop sharing my screen for a moment so you can see the beer. So hopefully you guys can all see this, but I did bring some home. I have one pin of it left at home. So I'll hold it up. This is the last remaining little bit of Nestor's Cup. Um, you'll notice it's very red, kind of a blackish color. Part of it was that what we put in Nestor's Cup uh, was figs and elderberries that very much colored the beer. The hardest ingredient that we had to work with were acorns, I'll be honest. Acorns are not the easiest thing to use in beer, especially if you're trying to get any flavor. And I'll be honest, we didn't get a whole lot of flavor out of it. ABV on this is about 4.7%, which is probably a little bit higher than they would have been experiencing back then. I'm guessing they would have probably been more in the 3% range. It's hard using uh, modern equipment to get it to dial down, uh, to be honest. In regards to flavor, even four years later, still really fruity, very tasty. It's starting to get a little bit of a sour tinge to it, but it's not very sour. Some of the, and we didn't pasteurize this, so it's um, some of those uh, bacteria are starting to take over a little bit. What I would do differently with it the next time is actually ferment it in clay. I didn't have that opportunity to do it, but I wanted to bring that here for you guys to, today so you can see that um, just a little bit. And I'll take any questions on that in just a moment. But just to finish up on Nestor's cup, in regards to the name, I took it from this actual, this actual cup. It's a cup that's found on the island of Ischia, right off of the coast of the Bay of Naples, in fact. And on it is an inscription that actually uh, has this indication on it. It basically says, I am Nestor's cup, good to drink from uh, whoever drinks from the cup straight away, the desire of beautiful crowned Aphrodite. Uh, will uh, seize him. And as you can see it inscribed here on the side of the vessel. Um, and I think it's really cool that that was there, Nestor, this mythological person um, from the ancient uh, Homeric tradition. What is actually indicated from, from Homer himself is that this cup, whatever was mixed in it, not only it contained gold honey along with barley meal, and I will say with the barley, there is no indication in the, in the Homeric tradition of exactly how this barley was processed. But you'll also notice above it, onions were included, all these random things to make kukeon. So at some point, I'm probably going to make an actual kukeon as a part of the Ales of Antiquity series, Ales of Antiquity series and ferment it 
in uh, clay. This is also another cup, just as a side note, that was indicated by uh, the excavators at Mycenae back in the 19th century as the so-called Nestor's Cup, um, as was indicated from the Iliadic tradition. Now, again, as I said, um, Dr. McGovern and I have, haven't always seen eye to eye when it comes to Greek brewing. I mean, I, I found it very frustrating that most people poo-poo the idea that Greeks brewed beer when everybody else around them did. And I kind of stuck my neck out there in 2016 to argue that the Greeks definitely did based on the evidence I found. Um, to further validate my, my theory though, actually in December of 2017, Valamati um, and a series of other excavators and archeologists um, excavated uh, two locations at Argisa and Arkadinko. And what was phenomenal about this find, so it was very new as of a couple of years ago, is they proved what I said was right. Um, essentially, uh, they found the evidence for beer production. Um, it might not be down in the Cycladic Islands, but it was up in uh, on the Greek mainland. And um, there they found emmerine corn and barley. They found lumps that they thought were starter cultures for beer production. Uh, beer mugs were found. Uh, and also what I found really interesting that they didn't highlight so much was what they excavated were these. This is one of the brew houses. What I thought was so cool is it's a tripartite division. They actually have different rooms for uh, basically for, for malting, for, uh, for the boil, and then for packaging as well. Very similar to the Egyptian breweries we saw earlier. Um, so I think that tradition, that convention is being transferred from one location to the next. Here also the emmer, einkorn, and barley grains that they found that definitely demonstrated that they had been malted, they had been sprouted, um, prior to being exposed to extreme heat fermentation. Here are all the drinking cups also that they found at the site. Now, just as a side note, this is very brief. You might say, well, how did they learn or what, how would they have known to malt in the first place? Well, that's an old convention and this is a topic for a different lecture at a different time. But kilning and malting of grains goes back a long ways. I mean, the earliest references we get to this is probably from Gerbekli Tepe in Turkey, uh, a location that was used for religious activity dating as far back as 9000 BCE. It's also been replicated um, in a more contemporaneous fashion to what we saw in Greece and Cyprus on the Cypriotic, uh, looking at Cyprus and the Cypriotic Bronze Age sites of uh, Paphos, we actually have full kilning locations that have been delineated and um, even recreated uh, where they know we know they were drinking or consuming beer. Now to conclude, when it comes to the Greeks and our perception of their production, their consumption of beer, uh, one problem is though that this is a, a, a you know a culture that's very much focused on wine and the culture of wine. And when it comes to the culture of wine, I mean this a lot of this is rooted in the the literary culture. I mean, um, we have to also remember that from the ancient Greek and Roman tradition, only upper upwards of one percent of the population was literate which, you know, if we were to leave it up to only the 1% of our population right our history, that's a pretty scary thing to think about. And that's kind of what we have um, from the ancient Greeks. And they really don't talk about beer. I mean, Aristophanes, well-known comedian, he doesn't really talk about it at all. He basically says that the poor have wine, well, they have better wine. That's basically all he says. And why doesn't he substitute beer for the marginally poor? I don't know. Um, he uses the word for brew, uh, the word brew, when he's talking about a baby, Phidippides, in one of his uh, texts. But some have just said, well, that just is like kind of like making a suckling or a gurgling or a cooing sound. It's not actually uh, any kind of reference to beer, though it comes right after his father served him sips of beer. So is it in reference to beer? Euripides, our tragedian, well-known tragedian. Uh, he says if one doesn't drink wine, they drink water. Nothing about beer. He even goes so far as to say in some of the fragmentary pieces we have left from him that comestibles of cereal and water are satisfactory to no one. So then unless it's wine, it's just not good. We have to turn actually to a Rotian from the Hippocratic tradition um, to maybe get a firmer hold on whether or not, you know, Greek beer or brewing was even a thing anymore. I mean, he uh, in the Hippocratic tradition, they reference all kinds of things that include barley, like barley juice, krithes zulos, or the barley, the krithenone. 
or the oinos crethenos, the barley wine even that comes out. And these are all things that are referenced. Now, typically though, in the Hippocratic, uh, the Hippocratic method, the Hippocratic terminology vocabulary references these things, they're in reference to foreign things, most notably items from Egypt. Again, another topic for another time because Egyptian brewing, we actually know they had a beer that they called Zuthos, uh, or at least the Romans called it Zuthos. Uh, xylem or zulos, all these terms that are interchangeable, it seems, for beer from, a, from ancient Africa, Egypt in particular. But the Greeks themselves didn't write all that extensively about it. Xenophon, for example, Xenophon was the student of Aristotle, Aristotle, Aristotle was the student of Plato, so on and so forth, you know, kind of that philosophical trend or tradition. But Xenophon, he actually talks about beer at one point. He says that there was barley wine in mixing bowls. The barley itself was on top at lip level, and in bowls were reeds, some larger and some smaller that did not have joints. Whenever someone was thirsty, he had to take these into his mouth to suck, and it was very strong. Well, this one poured in water, and the drink is very good to the one used to it. And most have said, well, this is direct reference to an outside source. That he's referencing what we saw at the beginning of this lecture, that this is Egyptian beers. The, the fact that Xenophon's having to describe for us how beer is consumed is indicative of the fact that the Greeks didn't know what beer was. I think that may be a little bit too big of a leap that the Greeks didn't know what it was, but maybe it wasn't a regularly consumed item for them by the time we reach the classical era when wine and olive oil become their major commodities, their major luxury items at the time. Now, of course, Alexander the Great, when he finally comes in, he's gonna usurp all of that territory from Greece and then conquer one of the largest empires that ever existed in the world. And who knows how far, quote, Greek beer or Greek brewing conventions might have gone. Again, maybe something to explore at a different time. But I will say in conclusion, the one thing that I find quite comical and hysterical about all of this is certainly the Greeks have not embraced the beer culture until as of late. The craft beer industry in Greece is starting to boom a little bit in the last couple of years, and I literally mean only in the last maybe 24 months or so. To the degree that when I was doing my research there, this is what my wife and I would seek out. Um, Fix is a great beer. It's a damn good lager. Um, uh, Fix Hellas, damn good lager. You can find it um, almost anywhere, but it's kind of what people want a little bit more flavor in their lager go for in Greece. Now, what was groundbreaking, and I do mean groundbreaking for them in 2015, was to release this, the dark surprise, Fix Dark, and it was just the dark lager. And everybody went crazy because now there's another lager out there. And it wasn't all that wild and crazy in terms of uh, you know, this uh, craft movement, for, but for the Greeks it was, and they didn't really have a whole lot to build it off of. Now certainly the Greeks and other individuals talk about beer production all on the fringes though, and they know it's out there. The Illyrians, the Dacians, Macedonians, Thracians, Phrygians, all these peoples are references, references peoples that produce beer by all of these authors you see at the bottom of the screen. Now to conclude, I will tell you what the, the Yale of Antiquity series I did at the very uh, beginning tell you kind of what I have already kicked off with um, and, and the 10 projects I've already done. Uh, the other, uh, what I have coming up is later this year, depending on how this whole pandemic plays out, um, I just returned from Britain. I have spent quite a bit of time there in the last 18 months or so. Um, on two separate research trips, and we will be brewing a beer from Hadrian's Wall, um, Roman Britain, that dates to the second century CE. That's next, next on deck for the Yales of Antiquity series. Um, I also, in, in general, just have to thank um, my, uh, my research team, too, though, just for, uh, for good humor and stuff. Colin Quinn, he is my right-hand man. Um, I come up with all these ideas, do all the research, but then he helps me try to figure out how we're going to do it in a modern uh, brewing uh, sense. My wife Sarah does a lot of my uh, the photography for me and helps me with my research. Our new daughter Zoe is an alcoholic already, if you can't tell, trying to climb into my wine glass. And then of course Kona, my dog who lays on my feet, she's drunk already in this picture, as you can tell. Um, at the same time though, if you're curious and want to follow more of what I'm doing with Ailes of Antiquity, you can certainly follow Chicago Bruseum. Um, Liz has uh, very much been incorporating me in all this, and I'm very honored to be, have become a member of the National Board for the Chicago Bruseum. 
um, uh, very recently. So you can follow there. Uh, for Avery or CU, uh, you can follow me on these two locations. Where I'm really good about posting, mainly because it's easy, is Instagram. So if you want to uh, keep up with kind of what I'm doing, I try to post maybe three or four times a week. You can follow me at the Beer Archaeologist on Instagram and you can kind of keep up with what, what I got going on. So I'm going to stop my share here and I'm going to open it up for any questions you guys might have. Um, feel free to throw them at me um, in any order you want to. And um, yeah, let's go from there. It looks like I might have something coming in from a chat. So I just want to see. Uh, will this video be posted on YouTube? That might be a question for Liz. Will, Liz, will this uh, be posted on YouTube if you're still here? Yes, um, we are going to be uh, posting all of our virtual events on the uh, newly established Chicago Museum YouTube page. And at some point in time, um, there will be links on our actual website, chicagobuseum.org, uh, for everyone to uh, sort of make sure you have plenty of information in a variety of places. Excellent. Thank you, Liz. What other questions you guys have? Anything, throw it at me. I'm ready. And you can either type it to me or feel free to just chime in on the video. I, I'll take either. Hey, this is Lucas. Can you hear me? Hey, Lucas. All right. What's up, man? Um, yeah, I'm something I um, was wondering about. You kind of addressed it already. Um, but, you know, just, just the interesting idea to what extent it's, it's mostly just um, the, the kind of a skewed uh, um, archaeological record, um, or in a sense, you know, I'm talking about like just, just the 1% upper elite were really the ones who were doing the writings and such. So, um, I mean, uh, yeah, it, I, I wonder, um, yeah, the more we dig and such, how much we'll discover about uh, beer being a, a common beverage. Um, uh, amongst the, the the lower unwashed masses, but and especially, I also wonder it was was really was beer regarded a bit more as a, a beverage of, of foreigners, and so amongst the um, all the expats and foreigners and slaves living throughout Greece, where they brewing and, and drinking, it's just that's not the aspect of culture that anybody's writing about. You know, I think like do a random sample of American sports coverage. And you, you'll, you, you'd never imagine Americans heard of anything called soccer. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah, no, those, that's, you bring up two critical components there, and I, I totally agree with you. I think on the first side of it, the first aspect, this idea of what's been lost in the archaeological record, I think a tremendous amount. And the reason why, um, from my work that I've been doing in Britain recently um, for the next beer, uh, what has become it's one of those things right like if you've been on a dig or you you even like watch any kind of you know, on national geographic innova whatever and you watch what they focus on and what they excavate they they move beyond those kind of things like when it comes to when it comes to food source when it comes to archaeobotanical and archaeochemical analysis that's a thing of the the very very recent past, right? We didn't even start doing archaeochemical or archaeobotanical analysis till the 19, as early, the, the, the really started in the 1980s, very late 1980s, became a thing in the 1990s. Now, the problem with that is that a lot of things that are not considered sexy, right, are discarded. And so what has happened a lot in the archaeobotanical and archaeochemical record is things are discarded. The other thing that I found uh, most recently in working very extensively on Roman Britain, which has been awesome. I mean, I've absolutely loved my work there, but they miscategorize or catalog things um, based on just what they presume the items are, right? So it looks burnt, therefore it's burnt. It's burnt grain, right? So they find, they find grain in storage locations and it's been burnt. Well, is it burnt? Like, why is it burnt and the building itself wasn't burned, you know, is the question that I start to ask. And one thing that you f start to find out more and more is that it wasn't burned, it was molten. It was, it's been charred, it's been blackened via the malting process, but it's not in fact burned. How do you prove that? You look for the fact that it's been germinated, essentially prior to it being heated via kilning. So I think some of those things have been lost in the archaeochemical, archaeobotanical, archaeological record. 
um, we, we tend to, as archaeologists, focus on the sexy things like kings and high-ranking politicians and the affluent. I mean, you look at Pompeii, for example, where I've also done a lot of work, and Pompeii, all the focus has always been on the affluent individuals that own the 30,000 square foot villas. It's not on the guy who had this little tiny shop that was on a corner. So I think that a lot has been lost as a re result of that record. The other thing, um, to your, what was your other aspect? What was your other question, um, Lucas? You you brought up another point at the end. What was it? Um, after that, you brought up something after the archaeological stuff. Yeah, just just how much it's um, well. Uh, uh, oh, foreign a beverage of foreigners. Oh yeah, yeah, the uh, foreign yeah beverage of foreigners. And yes, I think I think to that point, I think that a lot of it was. Um, with the Romans, for example, the Greeks don't write about it quite as readily or regularly when it comes to, oh, this is the beer you'd find in these locations, right? Xenophon is talking about what appears to be a Near Eastern Egyptian beverage, and he's one of the outliers of someone who's talking about it. But the Romans do it all the time. In Latin, we find all of these references, especially from Pliny the Elder. He wrote extensively about beers that were produced in these fringes of the Roman Empire. And he describes them as being different from one location to the next, and they're basically stylized based on where they came from. And those people also lived within Rome itself, and so we presume they were making the same kind of beer. The Greeks just don't write about it as much, and I assume that they probably did. I assume that there were people coming into Greece, they were coming into Athens, Corinth, regions around Sparta, whatever it might be, and they were brewing beer. It, would, it just wasn't written about because only the upper 1% of the population was writing its history. Yeah. No, it's a good question, Lucas. Thank you. Other questions, guys? Travis, there's a question in the chat about what the Roman Britain beer you're going to produce will be like. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so with Roman Britain, one of the things that has been hard to narrow it down is there's just a lot of evidence. So Rome, when it came into when it occupied Britain, it's an, an extent, it's a pretty elongated history. You know, it starts basically with Julius Caesar and it extends all the way to about the fourth, fifth century BCE before they're completely eradicated and run out. So what I chose to do, um, what is really cool about Britain is I've identified four different beer styles that were produced during uh, Roman Imperial dominion over Britain. Uh, that being said, I really want to produce one from Hadrian's Wall, um, mainly because it's the best known, but also because the evidence there is so thick. Um, so the one thing I will say about it uh, right now is that we, I will try to, I will be trying to harvest yeast from Hadrian's Wall for it um, to produce the beer, and it will be, and this is going to be a crazy one, we've never done this, it's going to be almost 90% spelt. Uh, so spelt wheat was 95% uh, of the crop in northern England, and Hadrian's Wall exists just a few miles south of Scotland, the Scottish border, uh, and spelt proliferated there. Um, looking at archaeobotanical analysis of the grain storage facilities, granaries, 95% uh, spelt to 5% barley. So that is the beer will be we'll be making. Pretty excited about it. There's another question about your uh, recommendations on brewing ancient uh, beers on the homebrew level, more specifically regarding sourcing unusual ingredients. Sure. So um, is this from John, I think, to what extent? Um, you, yeah. So Oh, actually, there are several questions. I'm sorry, I'm just seeing them now coming in. So in regards to using, um, for Michael, using uh, unusual ingredients, I actually think that the homebrew level is a better place to play around with this than some of the larger scale because it, it's taken me years to figure out how to do this stuff on a bigger scale. Um, with unusual ingredients, um, what you're probably, what you're going to get into with the homebrew system is you're probably going to be a little bit truer to the process because of the inconsistency that they were dealing with from batch to batch. Uh, but with unusual ingredients, part of, uh, part of it, I think you'll have a better, you'll have a better chance of sourcing some of the unusual ingredients. So one of the things I run into is when I brew these beers, now that we're canning them, so the last three Ales of Antiquity were canned, 
Um, we're not use, making huge batches of them, but there are six to 800 gallons or so that we'll make uh, at a time. Uh, trying to source something like acorn flour, it can be really difficult. Or um, most recently, Monticello, I had to find persimmon um, in an off-peak season, and that can be really hard to find. So with unusual ingredients, I think um, go looking online because you'll be, you'll be surprised at how easy it is to find some of these really weird ingredients in small quantities. They don't want to sell them in large quantities, but they're totally happy to sell you a couple of pounds of something. The other thing that I, I would highly encourage you to do if you're going to try to recreate a historic beer is try to get that unusual ingredient from the source, though, which is what I've increasingly uh, been doing for the last couple of years is that there are a lot of places that are, you know, growing ancient grains in Montana, for example. And those are good representations of the grain if you can't find them anywhere else, but they're still not going to be quite the same as like sourcing einkorn or emmer or kamet or whatever it might be from, you know, Egypt or uh, Jordan or something like that. And so if you can find a website that's willing to sell you those things from those ancient, those different locations, highly recommend going that route. And then it looks like, um, Liz, it looks like, I think you're following through the questions. To what extent do we have evidence for barley being cultivated or used for things other than beer in ancient Greece? I guess how widespread uh, what are used was barley generally. So barley, um, John, for barley, in regards to its, its references, it's pretty wide. Um, barley was actually more readily used than wheat. Now wheat is more written about, but it seems to be because it's a more luxurious item in the beginning. Um, as it starts to be trickled out. When the Romans finally get their hands on wheat, they considered it a more, they considered it more precious than barley. Um, anything, any bread that was produced with wheat was considered better. Any beer that was produced with wheat was, was char they charged more money for it than they did barley. Uh, and uh, part of that uh, could be twofold. One, you know, wheat has a higher nutrient content in most regards, has higher calorie content that's left behind after fermentation, typically. Um, in regards to barley, though, barley rusk is still uh, a component of everyday average food consumption in ancient Turkey and Greece, and it was back then. So it was actually used for bread production, but it, they called it barley rusk. It's very rough. It's roughage, right? Because there's no gluten in it. Um, so it's, it's going to go down a little bit hard and you need quite a bit of water or something to wash it down. Um, but it was used for that. Um, let's see. Go ahead. Somebody, was somebody going to chime in? No, I was just going to say, um, let's, uh, let's take Tim's last question here to conclude okay. this chat. Um, and, yep. and Tim, Tim being from, uh, being in England, of course, wants to know how Roman or how British is, gonna, is your Roman British beer going to be? Oh, great question. Uh, that's, a, <laughs> I, I don't exactly know because I am going to try to make it exactly the way they made it. So um, the way they produced, uh, as far as we can tell so far, there are a few locations where evidence has presented itself for actual industrial size brewing. In London, some farmhouses, some locations south of, uh, of Hadrian's Wall, and then a few up in Scotland um, near Antoninus Pius's Wall. And so we will be fermenting in wood, um, like they did, using the same culturated yeast. I would say the one thing that'll make it very real ale, Tim, um, for you and Brit and Britain, is that they would have not been consuming this carbonated or forced carbonated. Any carbonation would have come just from the vessel itself. And we have seen natural carbonation in oak stored vessels um, as of late for the Ales of Antiquity series. So I'm pretty excited to see that actually happening, but it's very low carbonation. So it's probably gonna be pretty close to a real ale in regards to the way it would have been consumed. And it wouldn't have been, the only way it would have been cold is if it was a cold season and that's the way they're storing it because they're going to consume it obviously at any temp. They don't have the resources to go source snow on a regular basis to keep beer cold like ancient Near Eastern kings did for example. Uh, in regards to the flavor, I think it's going to be drastically different. Um, we, like I said, we've, we started using spelt 
at Avery in the last couple of years for New England style IPAs because Spelt is a known haze producer. So to make a, a good hazy IPA, you add a little bit of Spelt in and it keeps stuff in suspension. We never, I would have never fathom making a beer 90%, 90, 90 to 95% out of Spelt. So I think it's going to have a pretty good body to it and it's going to be real hazy when it comes out. Um, but this is all based on evidence from uh, Vindolanda in particular, um, as this comes out. There are several documents that also, re also reference beer production um, from Vindolanda. Um, so I think it'll be like real ale in regards to the temperature, carbonation, that kind of stuff, and the way it's served. In regards to the flavor, I think it's going to be, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be a mouthful. I, I think it's going to have a pretty high caloric content. Um, it's not gonna be a hoppy beer by any means because they weren't using hops yet. Um, so I think it's gonna be a really interesting experience, but we'll see how it is. Cause I never know exactly how these guys are gonna turn out until I brew them. Okay, so um, we're gonna wrap up this chat right there. Uh, thank you, Travis, for an exciting and very engaging uh, discussion. Um, thanks to everybody who joined here. Um, again, uh, we're going to try to post this uh, at some point somewhere on the website and then later on on YouTube and uh, chicagobrazium.org is where you can find uh, more of these um, uh, virtual events that we're doing and uh, follow uh, Travis on Instagram, Beer Archaeologist, for updates on what he's up to. Uh, Travis, any last words there for us? No, thank you guys so much for coming out today. I'm really excited to be a part of the Chicago Museum. So looking forward to what we've got on deck. A huge kudos to Liz, Lucas too, who's been working really hard um, on putting this together. But um, Liz really the spearheading this whole thing of the Chicago Museum. I can't be more excited that we finally have this organization, this institution. So um, definitely follow them on every facet you can find on social media. And hopefully we'll see all of you guys, as long as this pandemic calms down, We'll see you guys at the uh, the Beer Summit in November, right, Liz? Yes, scheduled for November 11th through 14th here in Chicago. Beautiful. Can't wait. It's going to be awesome. All yeah, right. Thank you so much, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming out today.